My name is uh, Joran van der Wiel and I work for Kaspersky Lab as a security researcher. If you ask me anything about the product, uh, I'm afraid I cannot answer it. But let's start with the story. Uh, the first part is about the campaign and the second part is about uh, the investigation. But let's start with this. Very short introduction. Uh, the big guy in the middle, you don't see him really well, but the one in the middle, that's uh, Eugene Kaspersky. He is the big boss of the company, and he is important because he will come back later in the story. Uh, the rest of the people you see on this image are my colleagues, and uh, this is not how we usually dress, don't worry. <laughs> so we're a group of about uh, 40 people all over the world, and we are researching the latest threats on the internet. And now let's start. So. Uh, the story for us started with an email. It was uh, a guy we knew. He works at the bank in Kiev, in the Ukraine. And he asked us if we could please come over because he had a problem. Now, we do not come that over that easily because, you know, it takes time, effort, money, etc., etc. But he really insisted that he wanted us to come. So we went there to his bank and he took us to a room and there you saw the CCTV cameras. And he showed us a recording. And at that recording, at the bottom right, you see the time, and you see that it is one to three in the night. A guy comes with a big jacket on, with a hoodie, scarf like this, around his neck, so you do not really see his face. He walks to the bank, he opens up his jacket to get his bank card out, he swipes his bank card, because at some banks you need to swipe in order to enter it at 3 o'clock in the night. So he did it. He enters. And as soon as the guy enters the bank, the ATMs in the bank start to blink. He walks towards the first ATM, opens up his big black sports bag, and he takes out the cash this much. That's one. And the ATM kept dispensing cash until it was empty. Then he walked to the next one, same story. The next one, again, same story. And the next one. About one million later, in a bag full of money, the guy walks out, and that's it. We were like, wow, how did he do that? So first we thought that this was another version of the Tupkin mower. And the Tupkin mower works as follows. You go online on eBay, you buy a key for the ATM. Those are usually uh, standard keys. You open up the ATM, you insert a CD or a USB, and you reboot the ATM. As soon as the ATM is rebooted, it's infected with the malware. Now, this version of the malware only worked between 12 and 3 o'clock in the night. So, you go to the ATM that is infected, you enter a secret password code, and then you see a menu. And on this menu, you see a challenge. Those are, I think it were five or something like that digits. So, you get your phone, you enter the digits, or you call up to your boss, you give him the digits, and he calculates the unique response. You enter the response, and at that moment, you're basically in God mode, because then you can choose from which cassette you want to get the cash. So we thought, oh, okay, this is just a modified version. Now you don't have to enter anything anymore. They just thought it was too much trouble. So we asked for the hard drives, and we got them. So we took them to our offices, and we analyzed them, and we analyzed them, and we analyzed them, and we couldn't find anything. So we're like, what? what is this? Because the only thing we found was a weird VPN configuration. OK, well, so far, so good. We couldn't really figure out what it was, so whatever. Fast forward. 
because this was at the end of 2013, and now it's the beginning of 2014. Again, three o'clock in the night. I don't know, but somehow these things always happen at three o'clock. <laughs> um, we, we get a phone call. It was uh, one of our account managers. And he said, yeah, um, well, yeah one thing, uh, you have to call this number. Okay, but who is it? It's three o'clock in the night, you know, let me sleep. No, 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 you, you have to call this number. Okay, so we dialed the number. And on the other end of the phone was one of the most stressed out guys we've ever talked to. And he said, um, wait, I cannot use any profanity. He said, basically, come over here as fast as possible. So we got into the car, he gave the directions, and it was one of the biggest banks in Russia. We got there, and this time it was no CCTV. Now this time he took us to the domain controller. And I'm not sure if you know, but the domain controller is one of the most important servers in your network. It controls the whole domain, as the, na as the name already says. And the domain controller was sending data to an IP that was in China. <laughs> hmm. Why would a domain controller in the middle of the night send information to an IP in China that was known to be malicious? Let's find out. So we went to sit behind the computer. We opened up the very simple program, Process Explorer. We went to see which processes were running. And we immediately we found a very suspicious progress process. So we went to see which DOLs were also associated with this process. And we saw that one of the DOLs associated was VNC. Now, for those of you that don't know what VNC is, it's a, remote, it's a program with which you can get remote access to a computer. So let's think about the situation. Three o'clock in the night, one of the biggest banks in Russia, the domain controller, data to China, and a program loaded with which you can remotely control the PC. Would there be a chance, even though really small, that those guys are watching what we are doing. So let's find out. So we opened up a Word document, and we wrote hello, and then we waited, and we waited, and about like 30 seconds to one minute later, hello. <laughs> ah. Hmm. So yeah, they are watching what we were doing. Well, and then you get a conversation like, you will not catch us, oh, we will catch you. You will not catch us, we will catch you, poof, gone. Okay, so far, so good. But still, the computer is infected. So what do you do? Well, basically, there are two options at that point. Uh, the first one is to send the malware to HQ where somebody analyzes it and really makes a signature. The signature gets pushed out immediately, and the malware is removed from the computers that has the antivirus installed. But not all the computers have antivirus installed. So then there is a second option, and that one was actually really simple. We wrote a batch script, and the batch script just checks if a certain file is at a certain directory. If it's there, it removes it and restarts the computer. Really efficiently, and it worked. So we did that, and um, after a few runs, we were quite sure that all the computers in the bank were safe. But then again, the guy, or the guys, Maybe, maybe even girls, they were on the domain controller. So that means that they would have had access to all the hashes and all the passwords. So the security officer at the bank said, okay, everybody should change their password immediately, which is not a big problem because it was five o'clock in the night. Uh, nobody is at work, except that Russia is a rather big country. So in the east of Russia, people were already working and they had to change their password immediately which didn't work always as it should be, so they had to close down some offices. But still, the bank was safe. So at this point, uh, we knew how the malware worked a little bit, um, but we didn't really understand and we didn't really know how the campaign worked. So we did some more investigation, and as you can see at the top left, it starts with an email. So say um, I'm the event manager of a bank and I get an email and in the email is uh, we are organizing this and this event, we would like you to join. Could you please check the attached Word document to see if you're interested? So the event manager thinks, yeah, of course, click. 
And because the event manager didn't patch, or actually IT didn't uh, install the latest patches, as soon as the event manager opened up the Word document, the malware got downloaded and installed on the computer. So, first point of entry within the bank. But there's no way near that you can get the cache yet. So you want to get administrator rights as soon as possible. So you can use uh, some local, ex local exploit, or you can also install a keylogger. And that's uh, the nicest trick they did, I think. So they did that, they installed the keylogger, and then they sent an email to the IT administrator saying, oh, my computer is so slow, can you please come and log in? Oh, sure, sure, I'll go and check. Log in, log in, log in. And they had the password of the IT administrator. Now that password is probably used for all the services in the bank that the guy has access to, <coughs> which was the case. And this way, they could hop and hop until they found a computer that was really interesting for them. Now there is, however, one big problem. Uh, I don't know how a bank operates. I have no idea how the software works. I don't, I'm not sure if you guys know, but it's difficult and at every bank it's different. So they did something really smart. You can see it here at the bottom. They installed video recording software. And this is how it looks like. You can see that the quality is really, really bad. But it's good enough for them. Uh, it's blurry because else you would see all the details, even though it's in Russian. So we blurred it a little bit. But here you can see what they recorded. It's black and white, uh, bad quality, only the active window is captured. And they do this because then you don't send that much data to that IP in China or to that other malicious IP. And by recording what the other guy is doing, they can learn how the software works. They know how the bank operates. And then later, when the moment is to cash out, they can do exactly the same. So yeah, just like this, you see a guy working, doing some transactions. Uh, this is, uh, the that was the Russian version of Outlook. And they do some more stuff. So, back to this image. So, they found a computer of interest. Now you need to get the money out of the bank. How did they do that? Well, the most spectacular way was as I described. It was controlling the ATMs remotely. Another way was to manually increase the balance of the accounts of the money mules. So, for example, if the money mule had, uh, say, $1,000 on his account, they manually increased it to 10000 and then a money mule would go and get $9,000. Another way was to enter data directly into the SWIFT system. And SWIFT is used for international money transfers. So they transferred some money overseas, I believe also to a bank in China. Another way, and this was uh, actually quite a funny story, is they were able to control the computer with which accounts were made. So they just made bogus accounts for the money mules who had to fly in. And they gave the money mules, say, an additional balance of, um, I don't know, 15 rubles or something. Not that much. So the day the money mules flew in, they put a query on the database. And the query was something like, um, set balance to 10 million where balance is 15. So all the money mules that had 15 rubles on their account suddenly had a million suddenly had like millions of rubles on their account. We were good. But not only the money mules. Everybody who by accident had 15 rubles on his account was suddenly a millionaire. <laughs> yeah. Shit happens, but that's how it worked.